pastor announced next Sunday I will preach the greatest sermon ever preached. And all his friends went with expectancy and all his enemies went to get some more proof of his egotism. Uh, who would ever dream of announcing that he is going to give the greatest sermon ever preached? And when they arrived, he, he recited the Sermon on the Mount. And when he finished, he said, if anyone knows of a greater sermon, I wish you would tell me about it. I have found that that sermon gives us all the uh, laws of life we need to know for a perfectly conducted life. You don't need to have a college education if you can uh, spend four years studying and practicing the Sermon on the Mount. The trouble is, we don't practice it. We give so much attention in our, uh, some of our evangelical campaigns to the, uh, the cross of Jesus, the death of Jesus, the sacrifice of Jesus, which is wonderful. Uh, he so loved the world that he gave, uh, God saved his only begotten son. But Jesus spent his whole life saying, uh, telling about the kingdom of heaven. And ending practically every sermon, especially this sermon I'm going to talk to you about, with this admonition, uh, blessed are they who hear these words of mine and put them into practice. Uh, you'll find that you'll be building your house on a rock and it cannot be shaken. But if you don't follow these things, you'll be on sand. And Gandhi took the Sermon on the Mount. <clears throat> and he built a basis of, uh, of faith, uh, of uh, liberation. He liberated one-fifth the human race from the greatest empire that ever existed without the firing of a gun. And it's built, in, built on rock. It's going to become one of the great nations. Uh, uh, 200 years from now, it will become maybe the greatest nation in the world. <coughs> Indochina, uh, France did not obey anything in the Sermon on the Mount. They continued to hold uh, Indochina in subjugation. If they had granted them independence, they would have built on rock, and uh, we would not have had any communism in Indochina. I, I don't to blame. I, I, I just, uh, instead of getting excited about all these things, we made the mistakes back there, and the so-called Christian nations have made them. The young Christian nations, that is, who refuse to become Christian, are the ones who have been practicing Christ uh, the Sermon on the Mount better than any of the so-called Christian nations. And uh, the result is, even communism has stolen, according to Toynbee, one half of the Christian message, the half that, that uh, <coughs> the Christian nations refuse to, to take. I'm going to take that up uh, some later in one of my later talks on the world situation, and by just changing the name Jesus to Marx, they claim that they came to preach the gospel to the poor, to liberate the captives, uh, and to set free those that are bound and all that, that Jesus announced at, Capern at uh, Nazareth. And so we look at the end of this uh, Sermon on the Mount, and we find the first third of it takes up our relationships with man. It gives everything we need to know about how to adjust ourselves to mankind. And then he takes the next third, our relationship to God. And the last third, he sums up the basic things and the other two and develops a technique of prayer that he is 100% uh, 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 proof. Uh, well, that first third, he... Um, we call it the chapter 5 in Matthew. He says there are three types of people you must adjust yourself to. One are those that you're naturally drawn to, and then those are not, that you're not naturally drawn to, and then those that you just do business with. It's neither nor. The neutral zone. He didn't divide mankind into the different races, the black and the white or the yellow. He didn't divide them into nationalities, the French and the Germans and the English. He said, you go to Germany and you'll find the same types of people and the same types of adjustments. In Japan, we found the same types of people. The skin is a little different color, but the same types of adjustment. I have been, when I've been down at Tuskegee, mingling with the Negroes, I found they were the same types. 
so much so that there's one minister there that I found myself calling him Roland Brown half the time. I know a southerner might not have considered that a compliment, but uh, Roland Brown did, and he knew who the minister was. But there they are. And how are we to uh, adjust ourselves? He said, those that you're drawn to, uh, there's a sort of an affinity that is uh, normal and natural. It's a part of the divine economy of the universe. If you found yourself drawn, either by proximity or temperament, to everybody in the world, so you just ran around and just wasted yourself like uh, water poured into desert sand, why you'd never achieve anything. Uh, at the universities, they find it's necessary to have, uh, have some way a little group get together. And so they call them fraternities and sororities. Well, it's a little snobbishness and all that, but if they didn't join one of those, they wouldn't know anybody. I myself prefer the small college. I find that you <clears throat> make more friends in one year in the small college than you do in four years in the university. I have found that going apart here with just the 200 people for one week does a whole lot more good than running around and giving uh, addresses to 8,000 people every night, a new set of people every night. They get a little taste and then it all fades away. The thing to do is to find people who are naturally drawn to you or to the same interests that you have and do some creative uh, building for the kingdom and for the culture and for the civilization and uh, our dividing into families is, has its values and its needs into communities. But there is an affinity that goes way beyond all those things <clears throat> that uh, especially in spiritual lines, you'll find yourself drawn where you can work marvelously uh, with folks. Roland Brown, Glenn Harding, Star Daly, Frank Laubach, Rufus Mosley. <laughs> when we get together, uh, we can go much farther than when I sit down with Dr. Sockman, Harry, uh, Harry uh, Emerson Fosdick. I have great respect for them and they have with me. But the point is, we, we wouldn't have quite agree on just what steps, so we've had a nice visit at the end of the week, or end of three days, we haven't accomplished much. But when you're in rapport with each other in, uh, in three hours, you can raise the prayer as powerful enough to uh, move mountains. Jesus himself said, where two or three agree, that word comes from the word symphonize, symphony. So when you get a group of folks that, that, that you're in symphony, and just like an orchestra, you have a right to sit down with them, and you should love them, perhaps a special love and a heavenly love, because you were chosen to be with each other. The only question he said is, don't let that love run overboard into, um, into infatuation or lust or possessiveness. A woman has a perfect right to love her son. Why, it's a loyal, but wonderful thing. One oh, dear mother, one mother said, I, there are two things I'm proud of, my ability to bake bread, I bake bread better than any woman in Detroit. And I have two wonderful sons, but did they marry? No. Whenever they'd fall in love, and she'd just come in and spoil the whole thing. Here I've raised you up here, and you're just and you're, you are only hardly forty years of age, and here uh, <laughs> and you're thinking of running off and leaving your dear mama. <laughs> Why that possessiveness is a could be a crime. That's the thing you mustn't have. And so uh, uh, and then, uh, well, that's all right, that law works all right, but then how about somebody gets infatuation for you? And what you, should you do? Well, they want you to go an extra law out of the way, walk with you, all right? Uh, they want you to go one mile, all right, you uh, lead them all two miles. And on the second mile, they'll get bored and they'll get cured. Uh, no one, no religious leader, but they'll find someone, they'll get it for a while, a kind of a, an obsession. Uh, sometimes for them, that, that is a fatuation. And uh, I have found the, the greatest harm that's ever been done is where a religious leader has simply said, uh, don't you ever even come for another conference with me? Uh, people get to talking. Uh, yeah, you go to a psychiatrist, what you need is a psychiatrist. I've had women, uh, go, I've had to pull them out of the insane asylum. That said, that's what's happened to me. This Episcopal rector just represented God to me. If I could just weep on his shoulder once a week, 
I had uh, my these troubles that was just pulling me out, and I, well, I found that if you just let them come along for a little while, after a while, they, they, they get it for God. And they incidentally they can even strengthen you by seeing God through you, and then they begin to see God, and then they, they wean, as I call it, and there's most wonderful things that have happened. Here's Kirby Page. He just uh, used to just sort of tag Sherwood Eddie around. He's just a little replica of him. The limitation of him, I thought. The time came, and uh, Kirby Page, in many ways, is more, more of a giant figure than, uh, than Sir Red Eddie. Uh, I know of uh, folks that just have worshipped uh, Stanley Jones and have ultimately become uh, almost successors to uh, Stanley Jones. And um, Roland Brown began to think that Glenn Clark was just perfect. And he began then to uh, take my advice and, and let God speaking to him in his church. And now he can simply move uh, the folks all over Europe and Asia far more than I can or any man I even can know, even more than Stanley Jones. Uh, let them be a, an apprentice for a while. Shakespeare began by being an apprentice to, uh, uh, to uh, uh, some of those Marlowe and some of those and worked in conjunction with him. And then when he was ready to retire, he took Beaumont and Fletcher, young men, and he, uh, they collaborated in writing a few plays until he got them trained, and that was the best way to train them, and then they went off. Don't, uh, uh, and so uh, that is, is the way he, uh, that takes all that solution in. And then how about those that you don't, aren't feel drawn to? Does that mean that you're to be exclusive? I know. No, just because I uh, live in St. Paul, I do go across and have a Bible class in Minneapolis. That's all interwoven. But just supposing I went to Yale or to Harvard for my postgraduate work, that didn't mean that I should take a train, go down to New Haven twice a week, and go on past every Yale man I could see on the back and say, I love you, don't think I'm mad at you because I'm up at Harvard and all that. Why, that's all a waste of time. Stay right there, there. you've got your best... I was lost in Harvard, and I didn't know what I was going to do. So I walked into the Randall Hall, and a handsome young graduate student said, you're a graduate student. I had cycled through Europe, and I let my beard grow, and everybody could know I wasn't an undergraduate. And I spent a year there at Harvard with a beard on, with much, much more age at the age of, of uh, 25 than I do at now at the age of 72. I've seen the pictures, and you think I was a, my, I was a grandfather, and I was a grandson. But, but I walked in, and they said, would you be willing to sit at my table? I'm getting 26 uh, men to sit together for this year, graduate students. Well, did that uh, narrow us down? No. That way, we got into the heart of the college. We could compare our notes. We really developed. You've got to have a little that. That didn't mean I was exclusive with all the others. No. Yet we put up big signs when the Yale came up to play his football to hell with Yale all over the campuses. Well, uh, Dean Briggs uh, of Harvard was going to with Edward Everett Hale to see a Harvard-Yale game one day, and his wife said, where are you going? He said, I'm going to Yale with Hale. That's a little better way of putting it. But uh, supposing a Yale man could come up there and look at those signs and then just come up to you and say, uh, uh, well, what did he say, where do you, uh, do you attend Harvard? And I'd say, yes. And he'd say, look at those signs. And I said, yes, I think they're cute. And then he'd sail off and hit me on the cheek. Then what should you do? Just turn your other cheek. And he'd say, well, I beg your pardon. I, I know that's good sport. I, uh, I'm very sorry. Yes, said Jesus. Uh, they, they asked him, supposing those that you don't feel drawn to, that you don't say thou fool for going to Yale, thou stupid, uh, and call them all kinds of names, that you treat them with respect. Uh, but supposing they don't, that they say thou fool, supposing they go beyond that, supposing one of them hits you on the cheek, all right, turn your other cheek and then they'll apologize. If they don't, the Lord will uh, take it out on them, then he says, mine, I'll say it's the Lord, so you perfectly safe. Well, so he took care of all our relationships, and then he said, now, what, when you do business with people, how should you do? Should you jew them down and uh, make them sign notes and... Uh, uh, and um, keep a lawyer watching after them all the time? Well, no, trust them. Let their word be as good as their bond. Let they accept their yea, yea, and their nay, nay. They don't even have to sign a note. Well, supposing that they just feel the shirt off your back. 
All right, give them your vest and your coat too, and then they'll, uh, they don't apologize, the money will come back in some other way. I want to say very frankly that I have trusted people that way. I won't tell you how many, not hundreds, but thousands of dollars I have lost. But for every thousand dollars I've lost, when I did it on that kingdom, God method, uh, it came in about three times as much in other ways. I might say I built my little uh, income on, a, on every mistake I made, every cent I lost. When I did it, I gave it out in love. Uh, it just came rolling in. And especially when I tied and the things I gave away definitely. When I was uh, uh, gypped out of something by some clever scheming, or a schemer working on my sympathy, and I found afterwards I had been uh, had been cheated. Uh, I found in every case they were the ones that suffered from it. That somebody would break in and steal what they had, or in some other way their the business would go down. It was almost uh, so. I went and interceded one man that has uh, borrowed three hundred dollars and never intended to give it back. And he said, I'm suing a man for $500, and when I get that, I'll pay you back. I said, if you'd start paying me back, you've been knowing me a good many years, just $5 a month. It'd open a sluice gate, it'd create a bar takes, and it'd draw in that 500 to you. I'm not, I don't need the 300. I'm just doing it to, you so I don't see life that way, and I just, uh, I'm gonna wait and sue that man. Well, he didn't get the 500, and he never paid me. But the point I'm getting at, he shut the door to that 500 by shutting the door, by refusing to give that which he uh, should give. In other words, Jesus put it very plainly and just as sound as mathematics when he said in his sermon on, the, on his large prayer, the only footnote he added, uh, the only description he gave was about that one thing where he said, for if you do not forgive your, the, those who have uh, trespassed against you, neither can your Heavenly Father forgive you for your trespasses. And if you don't pay your debts, you don't need to. You can uh, bring all the pressure you can upon those who owe you, and you, you won't get them. Uh, I, I, this is such a sound thing that I've learned to carry this all through my life. A young man from a very sophisticated, uh, young intelligentsia type of young man came to heart. Uh, McAllister, and he followed me and sat at my feet, uh, learning all of the laws of prayer. But he wasn't a bit spiritual. He wasn't a bit pious and religious. Didn't go to church. I wondered uh, why he was following me around. One day he said, you're the only prop that got, that's gotten into the Atlantic Monthly. He was worshiping my intellect, that was all. One day he came into my office and he said, your philosophy didn't work, prop. I said, uh, well, uh, Jesus' philosophy worked, so my philosophy didn't. What's the matter? He said, I was held up last night. I was coming to play practice. A highwayman stuck his gun in my ribs under the elm trees out there on the campus. And he said, stick him up, buddy, and he took my watch. I was coming down Snelling Avenue, and I thought I heard footsteps following me. And I uh, was coming past Grand Avenue. I thought I ought to turn over and out to a drugstore and kind of shake off the feeling. But you said, trust people. So I shook it off, and I thought I'd follow your philosophy. And I, when I was under the dark campus, a gun was stuck in my ribs. Well, so my philosophy didn't work. A few weeks later, he came in my office and shut the door. And he sat down and drew up beside my desk. And he said, I think I ought to tell you, Prof. <clears throat> My father found that watch in the back seat of a taxi. Mother insisted he advertise it in the want and found, but he refused. He gave it to me. Folks, if any of you are carrying stolen watches, <laughs> don't ever go across dark campuses at night. If you have any stocks and bonds that you got illegally, you stole from your brother's uh, share and, the, and your father left a will, Keep them locked up in the safety deposit vault or they'll be stolen sure as fate. But if everything you have is honest, you can just leave your doors unlocked. I leave my doors unlocked if a man should come in, a highwayman, and wake me up at night and say, I came to steal your money. I said, just wait a minute, turn on the light, and I'll get my slippers and I'll get up and look with you, and between the two of us we may find something. <laughs> I have found financial matters are absolutely safe and secure. I'm supposed to be very impractical. 
And now businessmen from all over the world will write me in when they need help. They want me on their board of trust, uh, trustees. I say, I don't want to be on your board of directors, but I'll be on your board of spiritual directors. Roger Babson offered me a job. I think it's worth it probably would have been $50,000. And I turned it down because uh, I, that would have taken me out of this whole field where I belong. However, I want to, uh, these uh, men who uh, think that my uh, they don't... If you follow this, they'll talk about you like they did that foolish Gandhi. That Gandhi that they just laughed at up in England. When he came to England, uh, he happened to land there on a Monday, and the king came down to meet him, and the prime minister, and he didn't, it was his day of silence, so they all had to wait. Had to wait till the next day, because he had an appointment to the Lord to keep his mouth shut. Uh, that, that little man with a loincloth, Staff, oh, was, uh, liberated that uh, that whole uh, the whole uh, nation from the greatest empire without firing a gun. Uh, I was at the when I was on camp in California uh, uh, a few years ago. Uh, one of the one of the folks at the camp said, "Oh, I was studying at the University of Chicago this summer, and uh, your colleague in your English department." was down there studying with me, and I, and I met him. Now this colleague, just like most of the graduates uh, the, uh, from Chicago University, and McAllister and other colleges grab them up because they have PhDs and it lists their standard in one way, they had just about as little faith in prayer as any man you can find. And this happened to be one of them. And I uh, smiled, and I said, well, what did, they, did he talk about me? He said, uh, yes. And I said, what did he say? He said, you know, that Glenn Clark has some awful queer ideas. But the thing that puzzles us up there at McAllister is that everything he undertakes works. Everything he touches succeeds. But they're the most foolish ideas. I went out there in the athletic field, and uh, when the other teams couldn't find the uh, referee they'd satisfied, they'd ask me if I would referee. They trusted me to referee a game between the two teams. In case of doubt, I gave the other team usually the favor of the doubt. Uh, but uh, the, way, the, the way I would run those teams, make them almost a spiritual thing. I was even called in by the president and, uh, and chided about my uh, writing class. He said, the Bible department says they're supposed to have a monopoly on the Bible. And, you're putting so much religion into your writing class. They say you're running over into their department. I said, well, isn't this a religious institution, a the Presbyterian one? And uh, isn't it true that McAllister's gotten more stories and poems and the, the, the National College Student and Colleges than any college in America? If you want results, if you really want them, students learn how to write. I have found that when they began to lean on a power a little above themselves, like all the other great writers do, and I said, if you think that's wrong, uh, you have, uh, you're justified in your views, but uh, I intend to teach the way I found out to get results. And then he apologized. But uh, by the, about the very stories that I'm writing uh, to interpret spiritually, tell, tell more than some of the big philosophers. You know, a, a lamb always stands for the, an idea. White means a spiritual idea. Well, Mary had a little lamb, its fleece was white as snow, and everywhere the Mary went, that lamb was sure to go, and it followed her to school one day. It went into the English classes of Professor Clark, which is against the rule. It had made all the professors laugh and play to see him bringing religion into school. But then when they found it bringing us a greater reputation than any college in America, and I put it in the athletic field, and they said, well, that's, he's a funny guy out there. He really, they don't smoke, and they don't drink, and they don't swear. And they really to have a prayer before they go into their meets. And then they began to, but after we began to win everywhere, they began to change their tune. Now that's exactly what I'm saying about Koinonia. That's exactly what I say about the United States. If we can take a little, when I can take a little white lamb, my little dream of uh, this putting spiritual into solving the world's problems, and when I talk to the, the senators that I've been invited to address next winter, and I tell them about this, and they, some of them may laugh and play to see a, a little pious uh, thought like prayer brought into statesmanship. They may laugh and play when they did about, about uh, Gandhi, but they, he let them laugh and play. 
He just went around with the Sermon on the Mount in one hand, and he just proceeded to liberate the uh, uh, 50 human race from a power that was a, a, a power that no other nation dared, dared to have proposed. Uh, we 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 call it impractical. But when you begin to use the Sermon on the Mount, but I'm ashamed of the fact that we're so busy. Uh, I might even say that uh, there's one phase that uh, Billy Graham is preaching. It's wonderful. But that other phase we have neglected. And the result is communism has stolen it. They're going to steal the world right from under our, our eyes. If you don't look out, I have such a proof of it, I'm putting it into a book, the whole story of this journey. And if people read that widely, and if our government leaders read it, we can just see a change in the whole uh, movement of the world. Then the second, uh, he ends that chapter with a psalm prayer on love. Not any little peewee, simple little 90% love, but 100% love. Not just love for your neighbors, but love for your enemies and those who despitefully use you. Uh, for even the publicans and the pagans love their neighbors. But uh, be perfect, even as your heavenly father is perfect, because he lets the rain fall upon the just and the unjust, and he lets the sun rise on the good and the bad. You just love them all. Love, love all the way. Well, that's the theme of the first third. The next third takes up our relationship with God, and that's trust. Put such trust in God that you will uh, do anything to get in contact with him, to get right like one with him. Eat this, my bread. This is my, uh, this bread is my body. This wine is my blood. Just assimilate me, absorb me into your cells. Be one. And his last prayer was uh, in one of uh, the three sentences. He used the word one and oneness uh, five times. Maybe be one with each other as, as you are one and I are one, Father. And so uh, at oneness. Uh, how do you do it? Well, through prayer. But it should be the inner room, not the show off. And if you don't know how to reach God through prayer, he said you can do it through tithing. Just have a little stream, just like you have a blood transfusion, strap a, uh, uh, unite a vein in one to the artery in the other, and you can just feed that life-giving blood in and save their life. Well, if you were to begin tithing, and after a while, I guess, if you get enough money, so you could make God your senior partner, give him 51%. You'll find that that's almost as effective as prayer. You will sit down as a partner with God as you plan your business and your life and everything else. Uh, at a um, gathering at the Camp Fathers down in New Mexico, where some of you have been, uh, come up here, there was a, a young woman came and she said they may find oil under our land. I'd like to give you the, the, the leases of it. At uh, first, uh, one tenth, and then finally I decided to give him about nine tenths, and practically all of it. And uh, she sent some uh, contracts, but they don't know whether there'll ever be any oil there or not. But I said that that's the way I like to see things done, 100 percent, and then you can give back. Now, uh, when I uh, now that my children are supporting themselves, I, we do have first to have a duty with our families. And we have to pay their bills and the taxes and all that. I have to pay my taxes and my insurance and all that. But beyond that, I have everything as your royal honorarium I get here. I'll have them make it out to the foundation for this town. I can have them send everything, not to 19%, but everything that comes in to the, uh, to the Lord's work. And if you get 6000 a year and you give 5000 to the Lord, people that think you tithe and they get the impression you must get $50,000 a year. Well, I go around with a great reputation. People think I'm a millionaire. I get $50,000 a year. I get so many people asking me for money because they know that I must be very rich because I give 5000 of it away, and therefore they like to have me give a few more away. When I give practically everything away, it sounds big, but I want to say the value of it is this. You can look forward to it. It's just the thrill, you know, and you get your children all married off and everything. Nobody to squirt but yourself. And then you can just turn it all with the Lord. It gives you a sense of freedom and release, and it does. Unite you with God almost as much as prayer does. So Jesus uh, opened that door. And then he said, there's another door, fasting. They call it in those days, but I call it relinquishment. Now, if you're willing to relinquish some very precious thing, uh, like your, uh, your greatest 
love is architecture. But you have a call to go into the foreign mission field, and oh my, you have to give up to your architecture. I'll tell you about a man who did that, and he went into the foreign field. He really preached it. He was uh, fasted from architecture. Until the time came, all of a sudden, when he found that the, he was allowed any financial support abroad, and all the missionaries needed uh, were being cheated by the architects, and he went offered to serve them, and all of a sudden he found not only they, but everybody else wanted him until he had 25 architects working under him. And instead of staying home and making a fortune, as he hoped, uh, making a lot of money as an architect and supporting three missionaries, he's over there as a missionary and supporting 300 missionaries. He is willing to fast from that. I have found when I've been willing to fast from something that uh, the great things that come to it, if I did in the right spirit, to give up something, some cherished thing, uh, a person might have a chance for a trip to Europe. Uh, Roland Brown has a son, Roly, had a chance to take a trip to, uh, to Europe. And he said he'd rather go to a camp farther south and then do some work and start earning his money to graduate school, and he gave that up. I want you to keep your eye on Roly. He's going to be a great soul someday. Uh, if they have the capacity to... Um, to relinquish, and I, I, I fast business, we, we don't need that so much now, because there's plenty of food for others, and we don't help the world like they do over there. Every time anyone fasted, that meant there's some, that uh, scarcity can be distributed to others. And then he ended that uh, chapter with a marvelous psalm prayer on, not on love, but on trust. Trust all the way, 100%. Take no anxious thought what you shall eat, and what you shall drink, and what you shall put on. Look at the lilies of the field. They toil not, neither do they spin. But the Heavenly Father knoweth that they have uh, the needs. A uh, very cynical minister of the Unitarian creed who didn't believe all the way of Jesus, took Jesus just as a leading man, he really gave his sermon in which he denounced the impracticability of Jesus. Why, of course you should take anxious thought. That was the worst advice any sensible person could be giving. You should take anxious thought for the morrow, but he forgot the parable that Jesus gave, and the parable always carries more weight than merely the words. The parable is the lily. The lily is a field with no separation between it and its source of life, the sunshine and the rain. You build a lean-to of anger over that lily and a shed of fear and a great big roof of selfishness, and it better take an awful lot of thought. A woman is asking me, now, how can you reconcile this uh, high-powered uh, uh, striving to find God and then this complete letting go? I said, you need the striving to remove all these je jealousies and fears and angers and selfishness, and then when there's nothing between you and God, you're utterly in his hands, then you don't need to take any anxious, anxious thought. You can just... Go off and leave your business, like I do. I have a company going on. Travel all over the world. I'll just drop you in a few weeks during the year. Arta, Arta uh, just trust the Lord will send a book to you every year. And, uh, go around and give your time to helping people, and then if you find a spare minute, an idea will come through. Whereas if I just refused all these meetings and just sat and locked myself up for a year, I'd get so... Uh, mangy and uh, we're tired and uh, bored and one thing or another, my ideas have stopped. At any rate, I want to say that um, I, I'm not going, I shouldn't be using myself as examples because I see many others much more powerful. But the point is, I just reach out for any examples, anyone that takes the Sermon on the Mount, the very weakest person, the person the least capacity, has no brains at all, you might say, but just follow that. In his extreme simplicity, you'll find Things will be drawn to him. You put him in charge of your company, and it begins to prosper. Then you put someone in there with the greatest intellect in the world, and he knows how to run it. Here's uh, Franklin Roosevelt. He knew how to run everything, the war and everything, and he insisted on going over there to Yalta. Walter Judd and the other congressmen tell us things that, uh, that they don't tell out over the world. If he had been a little more like Eisenhower and said a little bit of felt that he was not so capable, and the rising horror has them pray every every time his cabinet meets. He leans on Edward Elson. Edward Elson leans on 
on his wife, Helen Nelson. Helen Nelson leans on her Uncle Glenn, and Uncle Glenn leans on God. And I don't know whether Eisenhower, just how he, close he gets to God, but I know he's in a stream that God is reaching him. At any rate, uh, all I know is this. A man who goes over and just say, Lord, you've got to take uh, We could have prevented all this mess we're in now. History will show it. History will going to reveal it. And I can tell you things about Burma and Indochina that nobody near knows how we, by our bungling and by our terrific selfishness, by the terrific profiteering and the enslavement by the white so-called Christian nations of all the dark races except in Japan, they're the only dark race that was not been enslaved and, uh, and exploited in all the world was Japan. And now they're sort of under our thumb. Uh, however, we are just reaping the whirlwind after sowing the wind. Uh, and now we're blaming, we got to say this and that and all that. And I, I, I won't go into any more detail. I've got to get this whole thing out. It all goes back to Jesus. The whole problems would have been solved if they were used the Sermon on the Mount. That wonderful, wonderful psalm prayer on trust. And then the last chapter comes out, seventh chapter, in which he says, now I'm going to sum up the essential things that you should remember about the first two chapters. I'm going to tell you the one thing you must not do in relationship to man and the one thing that you must do in relationship to man if you want your prayers answered. Next, I'm going to tell you the one thing you must not do in your relationship to God and the one thing you must do in your relationship to God. And they'll form like little sights like that on a gun. It narrows the way that leads to life, but uh, the wide is the one that leads to destruction. Now, it's a kind of a little narrow path to fit right in there, but if you get your, uh, follow those sights and the truth to them, pull your trigger, and by the fruits you shall know them. If you hit the mark and your prayers are answered, you'll know you're all right. But if you're not, you better look at those uh, those sites. Well, what are the sites? Well, the one thing you must not do in relationship to man is judge. Judge not. You get into a prayer group and they just sit there and commence to judge, judge, judge each other. And when the, the first one leaves and all the rest of gossip about her, and then what happens? We had a uh, prayer groups. So we know we draw them like this. And at Cronus, we had nine prayer groups. And number nine, by uh, the chance of the draw, all the powerful praying people of the Northwest were in there. Uh, I think there's Emma Fisher and uh, uh, Ethel Dow and Ethel Wiedemar and go down the list. It's just an all-American praying team. Why weren't they sprinkled around in the other groups? So when I went into that prayer group, I expected the most marvelous power instead of that. The prayers hit the ceiling. I never was in a group that was as dead spiritually as that was. After a few days, I uh, confessed my disappointment and so the daily civil life found the same thing. The weakest prayer group I think I've ever been in. Ren Harding said, I found it, but I thought there was something matter with me. But the next day, another leader, who wasn't nearly as good as I think that uh, Star Daly and Glenn were, said, I thought honors tremendous power. I, what are you talking about? That night, uh, Ruby Russell, who was that wonderful uh, accompanist of Alice Craft in the, in the piano, Ruby Russell, who was something of a Quaker type, she said, I went down, sat on a bench, and I, like I often do during a prayer group time, and just looked at the lake and uh, meditated. And a Negro woman came and sat the other end of the bench, and I said, why aren't you in your prayer group? She said, I'm in number nine, and I've discovered there's one woman that it takes offense at my presence. I thought if I stayed away, there might be more power. That night I spoke from the platform, my evening address, and I told them of a group that, where we all expected to have such power and there's no power. However, a Negro woman found there was someone to the fence and was blocking the whole thing by her attitude. And so this Negro woman stayed away, and there's great power. And I said, that ought to teach us something. Don't judge. If any of you there is criticizing somebody else in the group, you're spoiling all the power. Well, the woman whose shoe it fitted, uh, was the only one, I guess, that recognized the whole thing. She sought out the Negro woman, begged her pardon, begged her to come back, asked her forgiveness, and from that time on, that power in that prayer group was just soaring high. You don't, may not know it. They don't seem to know those things in so many of our religious gatherings. They think that you should have a discussion group, and unless there's a good, firm uh, viewpoint and different viewpoints, and you have the freedom to have a disagree on this, that you're a bunch of uh, sissies. 
I ought to say there's a lot of Oxford Goobers uh, that uh, believe of something of that nature. I think, uh, yeah, and uh, there's some of them have been in our gatherings at Koinonia on the board of directors that thought we were a bunch of sissies if he didn't just come out and disagree with everybody. And they said, well, here, Glenn Clark wants a bunch of CFOs and just the, so um, melt and mold and all agree and not have any opinions of their own. Well, we, I don't want to have. I want to have people that have strong opinions of their own. And then we all get together and melt them and merge them into one vast opinion. Why you can find that you think that you should have that opinion? Here's a, a woman who felt it was her duty as a good a southern aristocrat never to sit down in a group on the uneven terms with a Negro. And she was wrecking the whole, the whole uh, prayer group just as uh, some of those folks are wrecking, are wrecking the uh, United States nation. If we are ever blown up with bombs, you can know who's to blame. It's the way we have treated the dark races. Every time that we lynch a Negro or cast them uh, or refuse to let them ride on a railroad train with us, a million new communists are produced all all those dark races around the world. You, we may think that the uh, Supreme Court uh, came to a very wise decision. Why didn't they do it before? Folks, up in the higher places, they're beginning to learn some things. They're not putting them in the papers. They're commencing to discover that if we don't treat the Negro as, he, as an equal human being, we're going to simply be blown off the face of the earth. The dark races outnumber us. Uh, we're just a little minority. Wait till they get the bombs. They're not going to wait any longer. And this act has probably saved America, the United States. The way to save uh, such communism isn't to do a lot of, uh, 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 well, McCarthy stuff. I found more that McCarthy, over where I went, I found he was doing more harm to America, American prestige, than all everything else in the world. And he was turning more people toward communism. They say, if that's the way you treat and domineer over there, if people have a, opinions of their own, scholars that may have opinions of their own, and every person accused, and then a lot of them accused, and then they, only two or three found that really you're guilty, but and then there's uh, hardly any word that comes out in the papers to say those accused ones are innocent. Blocking until uh, there's now you can hardly find a scientist or anyone willing to go into the Hyde and State Department work. I met a number of great scholars who were planning to go around the world that they came to great national meetings in France, from Australia to France, but they said we fell over there, we checked they'd be stopped in there, and because we had some abuse of our own, we might be detained, we might even put it to the McCarthy Committee and just ground into mincemeat. We want to build a place where there's freedom of conscience, and where you can, uh, and all that. I won't go into detail about those things, but uh, one, of, one of the poets in our writing class in the New Mexico wrote that uh, Ike, he is a mighty man of a nation strong and free, and uh, and Joe, he's a mighty man, heading a committee. Uh, the army is a mighty power, was a mighty power until it came to pass. It was, it, came, it was near whipped, like the Philistines, by the jawbone of an ass. Now, I want to say, I might sound a little severe, but uh, many people think that McCarthy is doing a great work because he is working against a, a tremendous evil. But that's the wrong way. It's not the way of a refined democracy. I'm, very, I'm surprised to find half the people are for him, therefore I probably made half of you people enemies of mine just to say these things, but I'm just giving you the facts. The, the, the fact that, they were, that we've been pushing, however, on this war level instead of on the love level, when we're supposed to be a Christian nation, I want to say very frankly, but I don't like to be called a sissy. I don't like to have Jesus called a sissy. Jesus said, and the Bible it says, vengeance is mine, I will recompense, saith the Lord. Uh, you leave the thing alone and uh, send love instead of hate toward your enemy, and then his uh, hate so strike a wall of love, and it boomerangs back and knocks him down. The most powerful force you can use against an enemy is love. You might say it's the meanest thing, because if he doesn't, a reform, and he keeps throwing those boomerangs, every, pretty soon everything he wishes against you will hit him. If a man wishes you'd fall out and bump your nose, 
and you're afraid of him or you hate him, he builds a wall of, of hate toward you. And you build a wall of hate toward him and his little waist drops along, finds you a nice little bridge, uh, fits perfectly. He comes in and uh, his wish comes in and knocks you down and you bump your nose. But if you send a wall of love out, and his wish hits that, and after about three uh, boomerangs, and one of them hits him right straight in the nose, and down he goes and bumps his nose. When Saul of Tarsus uh, was pouring out murder and slaughter and hate against the Christians, and the Christians were filled with fear, he was just killing them like that. And then Stephen said, hold this not against them. And he said, and he had a man he'd been trying to reach and couldn't reach, and Saul of Tarsus, he sent a wall of love. Well, Saul of Tarsus continued to throw his boomerangs of slaughter and hate, uh, boomerang back and knocked him down, smash, right on the stones. I wrote an article about this, that love could be the way which we could defeat Hitler. I wrote it one summer. It came out in the summer issue of Clear Horizons. I asked Star Daily and, and uh, Glenn Harding to give up their work, and I resigned from college, and we took seven months going to all the large cities of America. Right in the middle of the war, we were sending love to Hitler. He said that's the most powerful thing in the world. Yeah, all his hate uh, things will strike against that old room burn back and will just, uh, unless he changes. Uh, we began November 1st, 1942. All the battles before that, uh, battles were defeats. After that, all our battles were victories. Everything Hitler did before that was just like magic. He rolled up Czechoslovakia, Poland, and France, and then all of a sudden something happened when he began to send that love out. He sent his armies against Stalingrad, and they were forced back. And then he changed the generals and put in weaker generals, and everything just went down, down, till finally a boomerang hit him and knocked him down so far that he never even got up again. Nobody even found his body. What I'm getting at, the meanest thing you can do, the most powerful thing in the world you can do is to turn out love. And then if, uh, if the other one, uh, if either reforms him like it did Saul of Tarsus, or puts him out of the picture, it is the most powerful thing. And for folks to say that I'm a sissy when I say that, change our policy and start sending love to the Russians and all that and beginning to, and to go into China and begin to build these things up in a different way, we could uh, even change communism. Well, we've, I, I, I've still got an, uh, on this journey around the country, I have found that every place where these things were used, they succeeded. Whenever they used the force method, we lost. Korea, we lost, and the same with China, we were losing. I, I, it put me in and make me president of the United States, and I would bring in a foreign policy that at first sight would look like the softest thing in the world, but not impede. It wouldn't be. Uh, it wouldn't be appeasement. It wouldn't be uh, some laziness or fear. It'd be uh, just like Gandhi did it, where he refused to let his men fight. One of the British soldiers said if he could just, uh, if they just fight, if he had something to hit. But this, oh, he said, I, uh, all he does is run around there with a loincloth and a staff, leading a goat, and uh, we don't have anything to hit. Don't know what to hit at. Just uh, there they were, just uh, while he didn't know how to hit at. India just got her liberation. Well, what are the things you should do? You mustn't judge. Uh, and you, what should you do in uh, the positive thing you should do? Why you should do unto others, you should have them do unto you. Then what is the thing you mustn't do in relationship to God? You must uh, treat with reverence all these sacred things. Don't despise them, and don't expose them for other folks to despise. Uh, it would be a mistake to go out and uh, tell your friends who are uh, materialistic and didn't believe in prayer, some things that we've been doing up here, and what did they say? They said they'd, after you'd leave their home, after a nice evening visit, they might be polite and nice, but then the husband turned to his wife and said, there's another pair of crackpots. Uh, and uh, what to do? Why, you would uh, diffuse the thing, like in a blood transfusion, let a little air in, it just destroys the patient. You let all the power out, just to drain it out, when you go and tell it to the materialist, uh, the swine, they trample on their feet. And then don't tell it to other people of, of another religious type who uh, think that they have the only way to God and that your view must be entirely unorthodox because you believe that prayers are still answered. There are good many churches and other denominations that say that 
All the miracles happened when the Bible closed. And anyone who preaches them now are an unholy trinity. Stanley Jones and Robert Spear and, uh, and uh, Agua are an unholy trinity. You tell it to some folks like that, and what do they do? They are like, watchdogs. They turn and rend you. I found the theological seminaries are the hardest places to speak in because of that. Uh, they're on their guard. They don't want their people fooled, and their young men are preparing for the ministry to get ex to uh, high flown ideas and then have them deflated, and there's some wisdom in it. But the point is, you see exactly, when Jesus himself knew that, he said, don't expose it. And when he wanted to go very far, he didn't even trust the 12 disciples because of a doubting Thomas and jealous Judas. He'd pick up Peter and James and John. They'd go up on the mountain alone, and then when he came down, he said, tell no man. Don't even tell these folks. Then what is the thing you must do in relationship to God? Why, uh, you must go all the way in trusting God. Uh, you look at the list of editors in the Reader's Digest, and you'll find the greatest expert on experts on condensation in the world. But they can't hold a candle to Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, who condensed the greatest life ever lived into a book like Mark's that can be read in one hour. They don't waste a word. Therefore, they can't have any repetitions. Now listen. Jesus uh, said, uh, in relationship to God, Ask and you shall receive, seek and you shall find, knock and it shall be opened unto you. They said it three times. I'm going to say it three more times. For whosoever asks it shall find, whosoever seeks it shall, uh, shall find, whosoever knocks it shall be opened. Six times. I'm going to repeat it three more times. For what father of you, if your son asks for bread, will give him a stone? And if he asks for a an egg will give him a scorpion, and if he asks for a fish, will give him a serpent. Now he's going to say the tenth time. And if you, being evil, can give good gifts to your children when they ask, how much more will your heavenly Father give you good gifts when you ask? Ten times. Then he said, in this sermon, by saying, blessed are ye if you hear these words and do them and put them into practice. So I said, Lord, give me a chance to put them into practice. And I got a letter. Uh girl who graduated 20 years before said, my classmate, Gwen, my best pal in college days, whom you, Mrs. Clark, and you love very much, has had an awfully hard life. Now she has her four children around her, and she has a fine teaching position in Rapid City, South Dakota here, where I live, and everything is going so beautifully and happily, and now the doctor says she has cancer of the kidney. He's to operate next week, and he's told one of the nurses that there's no hope that they're not even to call him in. Just shoot her with morphine until she dies, and not to bother him. I don't think it's fair for a, a good God to treat any lovely girl like that. So I went, uh, I said to myself, now how am I going to pray about this? Let's first see if I have a, any criticism or judgment of anyone. No. Am I willing to do unto others as they'd have me do unto them? Yes. Well, I'd be careful to expose, uh, I mustn't tell this to anyone who'll trample under their feet or who'll turn and rend me. I mustn't even tell it to people who have any doubts. I better not even tell my wife about this because the one thing she's afraid of is cancer. That's the one thing she doesn't really believe prayer. She doesn't see how prayer could heal. I, Lord, I'm not sure I have much faith either. So I won't tell it to her even. I went up into my room then, that's something I didn't usually do, and shut the door, and something I don't usually do. I knelt down by the bed, and I said, now all the sights are ready, but this one about the, the Father. Ask, and you shall receive. Now, Heavenly Father, I said, I have two lovely daughters, and if one of them had a hard life, and at last had come into a happy situation, I wouldn't grab her right out of that life when everything was so happy, because I love her. Now, I am not a father of Gwen. You're her. She's a daughter of yours. And I know that you love your children far more than I love mine, and I can trust your love. But you have a power that I don't have, and in your power, you can save her. I couldn't save my daughters unless you did it for me. But you have a wisdom that I don't have, and maybe in your great wisdom, it would be better for her to go to heaven. Maybe it would be for her, but then how about those children? However, Lord, I'm going to trust your love, I'm going to trust your power, and I'm going to trust your wisdom. I'm going to leave Gwen entirely in your hands and just let go. I got up from my knees, 
went down with peace of mind, went on about my work. Ten days later, a letter came. After three days, the doctor said, if she's making such a fight for life, I'll come up and take a look. And he said, by Joe, she's going to get well. That operation is a perfect success. The other kidney's making perfect compensation. Six months later, I got another letter saying Gwen is healthier than she's ever been. But the biggest miracle in Sa Rapid City, South Dakota, isn't what happened to Gwen. It's what happened to the doctor. He takes God into his operating room every time he operates now. I was giving this address in Miami over the radio in the largest Baptist church in the South. 2,000 people packed the church. They've asked me back twice more. I've spoken in that great church. I was a Southern Baptist, too, and I, uh, it thrilled me to have that opportunity. That afternoon, I got a telephone, and a woman said, I'm a bed case. I have uh, one of my uh, kidneys is gone, and the other is in constant uh, uh, hemorrhage. And every morning, I tune in to uh, Dr. Sockman. This morning, my radio stuck at a certain wavelength. I just couldn't get it past there. And all of a sudden, a voice said, now you're going to hear Dr. Glenn Clark of St. Paul, author of The Soul Sincere Desire, speak on the Sermon on the Mount. And here by my bedside was the Soul Sincere Desire that I had read next to the Bible and for years. I never thought I'd hear Glenn Clark. And when you told about that operation, my kidney, the hemorrhage stopped this morning, and the doctor came this afternoon, and he says, maybe it's permanent. If it is, he'll let me come over to Coral Gables tomorrow and hear you speak in the afternoon. <clears throat> But I can't stay for the evening, Doc. And she came. Tuesday, she came to Coral Gables and not only listened to me in the afternoon, but she took the potluck supper and heard me in the evening. Years went by. She came to Camp's Farthest Out, and the last I heard of her, she was head of the spiritual life group work in the, in the churches of Miami. Just hearing about the Sermon on the Mount over the phone, over the radio, did something. My faith is that just you're sitting here listening to me talking about this, or uh, bring the power out of that Sermon on the Mount just through you and into your life and all your relationships so that you'll be happy in your relationship with people, with God, and you'll have a power of prayer that you never had before. And therefore, blessed are ye who hear these words of mine and do them. So let us bow our heads and our hearts in prayer. Heavenly Father, how we do love thee how we do love Jesus for the wonderful way. At the age of 33, he could just pour out a message that all that we need to know in his sermon that would take 30 minutes to recite. Father, we want to ask your forgiveness for not heeding it and not practicing it more. We ask you that you'll help to let us make it now a vital thing in our lives and... Uh, and that uh, the government and the nations will commence to use it instead of just the, uh, uh, the technique of West Point and the armor of the soldier. Heavenly Father, you just bless us now, tonight, and these coming days. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. <clears throat>